Hello, everyone. Welcome to Membership Voice. I'm Kero O'Shea, the coordinator of The Voice and the host for this evening's webinar on the, on the wonderful Empowering Girls Project. It's important at this stage to acknowledge the Wadjuk people of the Noongar Nation, who are the traditional custodians of the land on which I'm hosting tonight's webinar. I acknowledge the strength of their continuing culture, offer my respects to elders past, present and emerging, and congratulate the community on ongoing initiatives in the, in the reconciliation space. Tonight's webinar is a little bit different to our usual format because we do have a panel uh, in with us tonight. And that panel will be coordinated by past Governor Susan Wakefield from District 9685. At this stage, I'd like to welcome and hand over to past Governor Susan. How are you, Susan? Very well, thank you, Caro, and thank you so much for all your help in putting this scary process together for me. Um, I'd also like to welcome all of the people who've come to the webinar. I can see many friends, so it's good to have Rotary friends who will attend your webinar. <laughs> so thank you. So a little bit of background. In the Rotary year just passed, President then President Sheka Minta, one of his... Um, Initiatives was empowering girls. And you understand that President Shekhar came from India and he has seen firsthand what inequality does for young women in his country. So President Jennifer Jones, our current president, is continuing the Empowering Girls initiative, recognising that empowered girls become empowered women. And equality is a fundamental human right that is necessary for peaceful, prosperous and a sustainable world. And still, girls and women worldwide face inequities in the areas including health and education, and they experience violence and poverty at a high rate, much higher rate than men do. So continuing to promote empowering girls throughout the Rotary world is important to improve the health, education, well-being and economic security of girls across the globe. And tonight we are going to hear from a committed, hard-working Rotarian in Jan Pryor, the past president of the North Lakes Tookley Rotary Club in District 9685, about her awesome project in Nepal. And we are also going to hear from three young women from Ravenswood Girls School for Girls in Gordon about an exciting project that they have initiated in Central Australia. So without any further ado, I would like to introduce Jan Pryor, as I said, past president of the North Lakes, North Lakes Tootley, get my words out properly here, Rotary Club. Um, Jan has worked tirelessly on this wonderful project, the Diddy Foundation, and she is going to let you know all about that just now. So thank you, Jan, and welcome. So thank you, everyone, for... Thank you, Susan, I should say, for inviting me to speak and Zonate for also inviting me. It's as founder of the Diddy Foundation, and the, and the Bright Future Children's Home in Nepal. It's an honour to be here and to acknowledge the work that we do in empowering women. At this point, I'd really like to acknowledge the support that Rotary has given me over the last 11 years and also Rotary Australia World Community Service, which is Brooks. And without them, I could not have possibly done what I've achieved in, in these years. And I'm also a member of, as Susan said, North Lakes Tookley Rotary Club. Aren't these girls gorgeous? They're, they're just beautiful. They're an excellent example of how, when given an opportunity for triumph over adversity, that a girl child, when given a lifeline, can put in a mighty effort herself and work really hard to get to where they want to go and where they deserve to be, especially in education which can give them a roadmap to success. Just look at them, they're young, they're vibrant, healthy, intelligent girls who are now forging out futures for themselves and a professional career. But it hasn't always been that way. So in 2011, I unexpectedly started a children's home in Kathmandu and 
it was an accident. It wasn't, I wasn't planning to do it. It was just, it was something that was needed at the time. And surprisingly enough, being a big procrastinator, I said yes. And so I wasn't here when my children arrived, but when they did, when they arrived, they were uneducated. Most were very sick and they all come with really sad stories. And at this point in time, when I didn't have much money, my medical bills were astronomical. So this was in April 2011. So let me tell you about the girls. So Krishla, she was eight when she came to us. So her father had actually sold her to be a housekeeper in Kathmandu from the age of six. And so when, by the time we got her, she had anemic dysentery, hep A, and malnourished and incredibly weak. She was actually quite close to death. And the other little girl near Mala, she was sick, um, sick, sorry, and she was bought from her village where she had been caring for two younger siblings. So those two are actually sisters and their sad story is that their father was an alcoholic and the mother had gone insane on the birth of the 10th daughter. And so on the birth of the 10th daughter, the father left because the mother had not given him a son. So she was insane. That is why Krishla was near Muller was raising the two younger children. So what happened was once we had both those girls' paperwork, then their older sisters who had brought the girls to our attention, they then put those little children who were four and two into other care within their families. So that was those two. And Honora, she was incredibly thin she was gone and suffering from malnutrition and her mother had no way of looking after her. her after her abusive husband left, she, she had no means to support herself. She had another son and so we were able to take on Honora and support her. Gorima, she's, she really doesn't have any great issues that we can talk about. She was happy. She was she was calm. She was energetic little girl. But sadly, her dad had died and her mother had no means to support her in their remote village that they lived in. They actually all come from remote villages in different parts of Nepal. So they came into our life and it was through sponsorship. And this is where Rorks came in. They were able to give me tax deductibility. So when people donated, my friends, my beautiful friends, they they got a tax receipt. So that helped. And we were able to provide then a safe, clean, nutritious living environment for them to, to grow in. So they all ended up attending private schools. They had tutors to help them with their studies. And I'd just like to say they all worked extremely hard to do well. Like they just weren't handed this life, this new life. They worked really hard. And a really sweet story is when Gorima came in her first year, I think lower kindy or something, on her report card, she got all zeros. The next year, she had one mark. It was a very low mark, but she didn't get all zeros. She had one mark. And then from then on, she worked really hard. And so after, when it she left school in year 10. I think she came about sixth in her class. So they ended up all being top of their grades. Nia Muller, she, the baby, she, she was accelerated twice in school. So that means she missed, I think it was grade one and then grade three or grade two, no, grade three. So highly intelligent girls who, had we not come along, would not have been able to have this lifestyle. They would have been married at the age of 15, most likely, or not being here at all. So, whoops, sorry, sorry, <laughs> whoops. So at this point, I'd just like to stress, there's a lot of bad publicity about orphanages, but we felt we were never an orphanage. We, this was their home. We, I employed a house mum 
and we had a manager who took care of them. And we had what was really successful about our home was that they had family integration. So their mums called them, their aunties called them, if grandma was visiting, the grandma would visit. And when they were old enough, they travelled back to their village at festival times to be with their their extended families and run in the fields and be with their cousin. So that's kept them really grounded. We also didn't have a volunteer program. We strongly believe that we didn't want that Western influence on them, which happens with a lot of children's homes. I mean, they did get foreign visitors, but no one really had a big impact in their life. And that was probably one of our biggest successes. So slide I think I'll use key so this is them now I took these photos in April uh, July this year so UNICEF states that the world's 600 million adolescent girls have it's been shown that given the skills and the opportunities they could be change makers driving progress in their communities in their lives and in their futures and you can definitely tell by this, these images of how far our girls have come. So they're all studying in college. They're all working really hard. And Nora, who was very much into the arts, she's not academic like the others. So she did finish quite well in year 10, went on to do year 11 and 12. And when I was there in April, in July, sorry, I actually registered her into a hosting hostessing course. And don't, it's a bit of an illusion because that was just a little bit of space at the back of the classroom, you know, for them to practice being air hostesses. She's the only one in her class that has applied for the international certificate, which we're hoping that she will end up an air hostess is on an international airline. I'll just tell you about Enora too. In Nepal, there's a caste system. And so her name is Enora Sundas. And that means that her last name, she belongs to the lowest class persons. And so those people don't really have the opportunities that other people have. They're often very poor. And so we've sort of broken that cycle where she, she has reach this level of being an air hostess, which, you know, even though she was a little bit of a naughty child, she's really proved that, you know, you can achieve if you've been given the opportunity. So when, like, I, as I said, it was unexpected that I would start a children's home. And when I found out that they were supposed to be orphans. And when I found out that they had mothers, I was just absolutely mortified. And so, therefore, once I understood the culture, I, I realised that women, certain women or women who were poor, if their husbands left or died, they had no way, they weren't educated, so they had no way to look after their children. So... I decided then to start supporting women so that they didn't have to give up their children. And so the Diddy Foundation was formed and to provide vocational education. So we started with five sewing machines in 2013 and have grown beyond all our expectations to empower women. We now have our own three-storey building. We've educated over 6,000 women. And as you can see by those stats, so many have gained employment and have started their own business. So we're really proud of what we've achieved there to empower women. And in 2019, we started to uh, started a cooperative and you know, we've had two years of COVID, but uh, regardless, we have been able to give out microloans to 277 women those remaining are still active. I mean, those women are still paying off. They pay it off maybe $1, $5 a week, uh, a month, no week, sorry. And, yeah, they just chip away. And it just goes to show that you know, given, if you give women an opportunity, they will, will achieve and succeed. And 
they they then become change makers not only in their t- their their life by supporting their families but in the community which then in turn supports the economic development of the country so we're really proud of what our women have achieved and with the loans you know they it might be just to sell a basket of fruit along the side of the road because before they came to us they may have been illiterate and so once they learn to do math, they can sell something. And so there's so many stories of where the women have sold from a basket on the side of the road, stepped up to a roadside store, and then started their own shop. And most women, they've been quite successful with their businesses. So let's keep empowering girls so they can be financially independent, so that they can contribute to their families and the economic development of their communities you know, and let's make women the change makers. And thank you. Thank you, Jan. I'm always inspired by Jan's story and to see the photos of the girls t- tonight is just wonderful. So that is exactly what past RI President Shekhar was aiming for when he developed this initiative and it's just, it's just awesome to see that it's still continuing. It it makes us makes me feel very lucky to be the person I am and have had the opportunities I've had. So we're now going to hear from the girl uh, from the teachers and a student from Ravenswood Girls School in Gordon. It's a uniting church school and. Um, Kate Prowse will tell us about the program. Thank you, Kate. Thanks, Susan. Um, Yeah, so I'm a a teacher at Ravenswood and I teach in the uh, religious education department. We're coming tonight from a slightly different angle uh, where we have um, students coming from the North Shore of Sydney who are um, we, we have been part of a program that uh, we had our inaugural uh, immersion this year. Uh, Ravenswood has a strong commitment to empowering our girls and in particular one of those spheres of influence is um, comes from our uh, service learning coordinator Laura McGilvray who is joining us tonight as well and she runs uh, overseas a program that encourages our students to look beyond themselves um, under her guidance uh, this inaugural Central Australia immersion uh, took place this year Uh, Previously, we've had immersions in Cambodia and in Fiji, uh, but for quite a number of years now, we've been very keen to have uh, a Central Australian immersion. Uh, So we did that in partnership with a provider, Red Earth, and um, that came to life this year. As Susan said uh, at the very beginning, empowering girls today means we're empowering our women of the future And at Ravenswood, as at many schools, we feel it's really important uh, to give our students an understanding of First First Nations people in Australia. And as we move forward in this uh, conversation that's been happening for, you know, 200 years, but is really coming to light and into its own, uh, we feel very strongly about giving our students a voice and an understanding of what um, what that looks like and what that means. And for many of our students who participated, they'd never been to Central Australia, uh, so that in itself was, was a pretty eye-opening experience. But to have the opportunity to um, really spend time on country with traditional owners, uh, I think, uh, was was just such an extraordinary experience. Um, uh, experience for them. I was fortunate enough to participate as a, as a staff member and for me personally to see our girls come to life with um, their understanding is just, it's such a privilege. So I'd like to hand over to Laura who uh, might tell us a little bit more about her role at Ravenswood and then she will um, introduce you to Zara. Thanks, Laura. Thank you, Kate, and thank you so much, everyone, for um yeah, for, for being with us tonight. It's so lovely to see so many lovely faces and I know that this will go wider as well. Um, so as Kate mentioned, part of my role at Ravenswood, I'm, I'm a high school teacher, but also oversee 
um, the social justice and the service learning elements that we have at school. Um, and that encompasses um, quite a, a large program. We've got lots of different um, organisations that we partner with and that we support. And there's a fundraising element, but um, wherever possible um, and as much as possible, we, we really love to get the, the girls involved in a really um, meaningful and, and hands-on way. So we have a wonderful group um, called Days for Girls that Kate actually coordinates um, where uh, two lunch times a week girls come and they help to create menstrual health kits that are then distributed around the world, which is a whole other topic for maybe another time. Um, but uh, yeah, that's just, just one of the groups. Every day of the week at, at Ravenswood, there's a lunchtime group that girls can be involved in. Um, and we really encourage them to, um, yeah, not, not only support um, causes and issues and, and think about them and talk about them, but um, really uh, uh, involve themselves. And I think when we talk about empowerment, that has been a really significant and important part of that. Um, as Kate mentioned, for several years now, we've had um, overseas immersions to Fiji and to Cambodia um, and looking to Vietnam as well. Um, because of COVID, we didn't have the overseas immersions. And so it was quite a good opportunity for us to to finally um, kind of think a little bit more seriously about what well, we had been wanting to do an Indigenous immersion and, and learn more about First Nations communities and peoples. Um, so it was a uh, quite a good time for us this year to, to get in, that into action. Um, we worked with a wonderful group called Red Earth. Um, and one of the reasons that we particularly were drawn to working with Red Earth was because of their, um, their model of partnership that they, um, that they have. So rather than uh, rather than the trip being ex expressly or exclusively a service trip where we go and, you know, volunteer or um, uh, teach or, or, or act in some way, more than anything, it was a, a genuine immersion and for our students to go and be in a place. Um, and I know that Zara, Zara will speak about what this felt like for the students, um, but to go and be in that place, to get to know people, just to sit and to listen and to experience um, life in two different remote Indigenous communities um, just for a few days, but really meaningful days. Um, so we, we really loved that, that approach that they took. Um, and I know that you'll hear from Zara um, that the girls had a wonderful, um, a wonderful time. Kay was our primary leading teacher on that trip, which was really wonderful. And we had 16 uh, year 11 students, so about 16, 17 year olds. So Zara, I might pass over to you now. Zara is a year 11 or well, almost year 12 student um, at Ravenswood, um, one of our absolute superstars in every single way. Um, but uh, yeah, certainly um, we'll have some wonderful reflections of this trip. Thanks, Zara. Um, thanks for having me. I'd like to acknowledge that I'm presenting from the land of the Gurungai people who all, um, and would like to acknowledge that this always was and always will be Aboriginal land. Um, so before I kind of get into talking about the immersion, I'd like to just talk about this idea of empowerment a bit more. Um, so to jump straight in, Google says that to empower means to give someone the authority or the power to do something. This suggests that empowerment is sort of determined by others or determined by external forces. And in some cases it is, in many cases. But I think we should also be asking ourselves, how can I empower myself? Um, so I'd like to introduce sort of three steps or tools for empowerment that I try to carry with me and have been thinking about a lot since the immersion. Um, these are showing and earning trust and respect, learning and being curious, and perseverance or striving for goals in the face of challenges. Um, these three or this toolkit now bring me to my experience with Red Earth Immersion because they are kind of where it originated for me in terms of my own thinking about, about this idea of empowerment and empowering ourselves. Um, it's because of this trip that I've come to think about empowerment in the way that I do now. So going to the Northern Territory and getting to see Australia's incredible natural diversity was amazing. Um, I've been, well, thanks to this trip, I've now been to every state in Australia, but I think the NT was probably the most just completely different and removed from what we see in everyday life. Um, and it was just something uh, it was it was amazing you know something out of the paintings but you know th there was something about kind of flying in over over Darwin and seeing the color of the water and I, I know if you ask anyone on the trip that was kind of one of the first things they'll mention as, as we were flying in because 
you know, we were all kind of waking up. It was early morning and this water was just so blue. And it's just these memories that we all made together, these little details that sort of form the the frame or the structure of, of these things that we've learned. Um, we learned a lot throughout the immersion about native flora and fauna and different ways of living with the land. Um, an example of this, I remember from one of the bushwalks we went on, where the, one of the um, guides told us about how First Nations people will burn areas of land um, which uh, are overgrown or have too much, you know, dead foliage so that new growth can come through. And, you know, they, they do this in a way where they kind of work with the land and they, they listen to how far along the land is in this process and kind of work with it and they don't try and control it. And I think this was one of the first points where I, I started to think more about how their lifestyle is so different to ours when, when they're able to work and how much being respectful of other living things and respectful of the land that they live on can change the way that they kind of exist and and the way that they you know work amongst themselves as well um, we visited two different homelands in the top end region the first was called Nayu and the second was Mengen um, and we also had one short stint in Catherine Gorge where we got to go on a boat river tour which was incredible as well um, we had the honor of being formally welcomed to country at both Nayu and Mengen which, you know, I think uh, we, we were told that it was going to be an experience, but it was really an experience. Um, they explained, so the first welcome to country was in the Daly River at Nayu. And um, the what they did, they, they got us to walk into the water and then they put some water on our heads and our stomachs. And they explained that, you know, it's, it's, your, it's your, your wisdom and your thought and your um, life and as the water drips off you into the into the river, then it travels downstream and the ancestors of that land then recognise you as being welcome and you can always go back. Um, and it was a similar thing at Mangan as well. Where we had water on our heads. And I think that was, a and again, a really incredible experience to kind of feel that welcome because it suggested that, you know, we can go back to those places on our own. We can take that initiative to go and explore. And that was you know, a moment of, of empowerment for us as a group as well, and kind of a moment where we really started to go, wow, this is this is really something else. Um, we had the chance to visit ancient rock art sites. Um, we sat with community elders, listened to stories, and dove for red ochre in a creek. Um, and as you can see in the picture on the the left on on the slide there, and um, I could go on and on about all the things that we did, but I think it's the learning that happened through these activities that really gave this trip its significance. So the bond we formed as a group across the 10 days was something akin to a big family. We were with each other 24 seven and had so much fun, but we were also there for, there for each other all the time. We lifted each other up, solved problems, trusted and encouraged each other and learned to persevere. Uh, without properly realizing it or consciously thinking about it, we empowered each other to to do all these things, to learn, to ask these questions. Um, and I think it's that natural bond, particularly among women and girls, that just kind of forms because, you know, w when we all stand together, we just feel that we're stronger. And I think us all kind of standing together, you know, we would sing Hamilton on the bus or we would, you know, all kind of help pack up the camp at, at night together. And it was just those little things that were really empowering because we knew that we weren't doing it alone, we were doing it together. And then we could trust in each other that when it came to the bigger things or when someone was homesick or that kind of thing, we would all be there to kind of lift each other up and help each other. So that was, I think, a really beautiful, um, beautiful thing about the trip as well. Um, the other invaluable part of this learning was everything going on around us. Uh, and this is where particularly the environment, so the, the empowerment toolkit comes in that I mentioned before. In terms of respect and trust, Establishing these in our interactions opened doorways into these amazing conversations with elders in the communities. Um, you know, we, we heard stories about their lives. We heard stories about kind of the dynamics within the communities, how they differ from our own here in Sydney or in other parts of the world, um, obviously. And yeah, it was that we, we had to kind of form this this bond of trust and respect with these people for them to open up and share their stories. You know, you, you're not just going to kind of tell the, these things about yourself without feeling that the person receiving them is open-minded and respectful enough to to receive them in a way that will kind of benefit both sides. Um, this respect also comes in the form of silences as we found throughout the trip and just listening or being in a moment. 
Every day we'd practice something called Didiri, which loosely means to be present um, in one of the um, languages of the lands that we visited. We, so every day we'd take one or more kind of deliberate five minute breaks to be silent and to appreciate everything around us. Um, I also mentioned the idea of learning and curiosity. We know education is empowering and, you know, it's, it's an incredible tool where we, you know, we grow, we learn. But I think, though, that the importance of curiosity and the learning we choose is often overlooked. Um, there was so much learning that we chose on this trip. We asked questions. We looked deeper. We found the importance of empathy and endeavouring to understand people from places and lives that were really, really different to our own and yet not so different at all. You know, we're all human. <laughs> We empower others by showing them empathy and we empower ourselves by being curious enough to ask the right questions and further our knowledge. An example of this is the opportunity we had to ask Bill Harney, who was one of the um, amazing elders at the Mencken community, about his early life. Um, another example is, is the chance that we got to kind of meet and hang out with the kids at both Nayu and Mengen and just kind of see how they were living and, and how they interacted with us and each other. And there was just this joy in both places that you wouldn't I, I don't know I, th I think we talked about it afterwards where none of us had really expected it to be there as much as it was um because to our eyes the people had so little in a material sense um and I guess that sort of thing kind of really makes you think about what really matters and what you can do with with so little as I said in, in a material sense um and then I know personally that's kind of, again, a point where I started to think more, well, how can I still be strong? How can I still do things that that help people or that, that better something with so little? Um, the third thing, as, as I mentioned in the toolkit, is perseverance. And perseverance in terms of this trip was demonstrated every day of the immersion. Um, perseverance is also quite nuanced and it can appear on any scale, but is still equally important in any form. So we learned from Bill about something called the Wavehill Walk-Off, which was a strike led by Vincent Lingari, where the Aboriginal workers from Wavehill Station um, walked to the banks of the Victoria River to protest their poor pay and working conditions um, and the loss of their land. They stayed there for seven years on the, at, at the river and refused to go back until something changed. I think this is an absolutely incredible example of how perseverance and standing up for what you believe can cause positive change. A smaller example, but one no less important to us, is the perseverance of our own immersion group through the task of cleaning Bill's house, which was our service project or the thank you to the Mangan community. Um, it was quite a daunting task when we first started and a difficult day for many people, but we all encouraged and supported each other throughout and worked as a team to reach the goal. We were empowered by our success and the knowledge that we'd kind of pushed the limits of what we thought we could do. You know, we 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 all had to kind of because physically it was a very daunting task because this house was respectfully quite dirty, um, but we all went in there with kind of this really positive attitude because we were getting towards the end of the uh, end of the trip and we wanted to make the most of everything we had. So you know, there was music playing and everyone was kind of ma making jokes and dancing around, and we got to the end of the day and we're like, wow, we did it. You know, look at what we did. So yeah, that was a really amazing thing as well. Um, now, I know I'm possibly running out of time, so I'd like to end on a final thought. So often we listen because we believe we owe others silence and speak only when space is left for us. It becomes like a script. Speak, pause, wait for the next opening. The immersion experience taught me, though, that we don't necessarily owe silence to others but to ourselves. If we take the silences and use them to learn, then our voices will ring out that much clearer. Remember the toolkit. Let's be respectful and build trust. Let's dare to learn and be curious. And let's keep going even when we feel powerless. Don't just speak in the silences left by others. Listen, then raise your voice and call attention, call the attention that your words deserve. Take your turn and then leave space for others to follow. We're all writing stories as we go, whether unconsciously or otherwise. We deserve to feel empowered, to empower ourselves, to write the stories that reflect who we are and what we know we can do. Because we can do anything if we just pick up a pen. Thank you. Thank you, Zara. That was um, an awesome presentation. Thank you also, Laura and Kate. Um, I really didn't know what to expect when I asked Kate if she could um, facilitate coming on to the um, webinar. And um, 
I'm glad my faith in her abilities <laughs> hasn't wavered. So um, I would like to say that we were expecting two other presentations, which um, unfortunately haven't come through. Um, I was particularly disappointed that the um, Homes for Hope in Suva, Fiji couldn't be presented tonight, but um, technical difficulties and other issues. But um, what I want to say is that this program, this Empowering Girls Initiative of our RI presidents is wide ranging and not just aimed at looking at helping people in poorer situations than ours. I personally believe that in Australia and New Zealand, we have many opportunities to empower our young women in all sorts of ways. And the program of immersion from Ravenswood School just shows the value of doing that. Um, many, many um, organisations around our two countries and the rest of the Pacific and Timor-Leste, the Girl Guide Associations of all our countries have as their mission statement empowering women and girls and young women and um, I've encouraged many many clubs to reach out to their local guide districts and see what they can do to help those girls. In New South Wales there's a program called um, Supporting and Linking Trades Women its initials are SALT and they run workshops all around the state by taking um, trades women, carpenters, electricians, uh, mechanics, and they go into high schools and they run workshop sessions for the Year 9 and 10 girls to show them that they don't have to just look at the female trades or the female jobs, nursing, teaching, veterinary nursing. Um, and they give them a hands-on half day, a whole day of uh, woodwork or mechanical whatever. I mean, I'm totally not a mechanical hands-on person, apart from sewing and cooking. But this this program is awesome. So if it comes to somewhere near you or you hear about it, see if you can support it. Um, so, Caro, are there any questions? There certainly are, and no. I, there certainly are, and I think the first of them is for you, Susan, and it's mm -hmm. come from Glenda Bryson in Bendigo. Over to you, please, Glenda. Hey, thanks, Caro. And and Bendigo's getting swamped by rain. I I might be able to get out of the town the day after the next, but uh, <laughs> I'm safe. So, um, look, I just need to firstly say, awesome to hear. All of the ladies, but Zari, you are a special girl. You are going to go so far. I expect to see you up there as potentially our next prime minister. <laughs> don't know. You don't. You don't get into politics if you don't want to. But gee, you're going to lead. You are a leader of our future. And well done to the school for empowering her as well. So. My, my question is about this immersion program. Tonight, I before tonight, I'd never heard of it, and, and that's nothing new. I don't know everything in the world, but how do other schools get involved in this? Or please explain. Okay, so, Laura, would you like to um, answer this tricky yeah. question? Thank you, Susan, and thank you, Glenda. Um, so I've just posted in the chat the, um, the website for Red Earth. So the group is called Red Earth. They're a wonderful organisation. They work with lots and lots of different schools, um, taking them on, on immersions. They also do some um, teacher trips or, um, yeah, trips for not only students, um, but their main game is, is taking students with some parents, uh, sorry, with some teachers um, to the top end, to Central Australia and to Cape York. And there are three main areas at the moment. Um, and, yeah, they're, they're wonderful. We've only had um, good things to say about working with Red Earth. How long has your school been in doing this immersion program? Sorry, Caro, I've done another question. I know, naughty. Um, th this is our first trip, Linda. So um, this was the, the very first time. We hoped we were, we were planning to run it last year, but because of COVID, uh, we're not able to. Um, so this is our first, but we're planning on, on running it every year from now on. 
Oh, excellent. Well done. Well done. Thank you. That's so, okay. Um, sorry, so, Kero. So, no, Laura, or Kate, you've had different programs in Vietnam and, no, Cambodia and Fiji. Were they similar immersion-type programs or were... Uh, in some ways, they were similar. I might get Kate to talk about Fiji. The Cambodia trip was um, actually in partnership with our brother school, Knox Grammar, which is just up the road from us, another United Church school, um, where girls and boys formed um, teams and kind of um, rotated through different areas in that country. I think Kate actually has been on both of those trips, so I might pass over to Kate. Thanks, Laura. Uh, yes, I, I was lucky enough to uh, attend both uh, immersions to Fiji and to Cambodia, and they really were quite different. Um, uh, our students are quite well-travelled uh, themselves, a lot of them. Um, Cambodia sort of had this mystique to it, and the girls always thought that that was a very interesting place to go. Um which it is, uh, Fiji, so a lot of them had been there on, on family holidays, but the opportunity there was quite different to what they'd experienced. We were living within a, um, a rural community and we were working in a school there. So we taught in the school for a week um, and the girls actually, basically the teachers took that as a week off and pretty much left the girls in charge um, of, you know, 40 or 50 um, children, which was quite challenging. Um, but this, the Red Earth Immersion, uh, I think Laura mentioned uh, at the beginning, it was quite different because, and, and as did Zara, we were really there to listen and to um, immerse in the way of just being there, not not trying to fix anything and not trying to come in and say this is how we do it and, and perhaps our way is a better way. Um, and sometimes immersions uh, can, can have that, um, a slight angle on them, um, which, you know, they have their uh, positives, but there's also some negatives um, that, Jan, you brought that up when you talked about the orphanage experience as well. Um, so this was quite different in that it really was very much a listening opportunity and experiencing being in Central Australia, but also being on country with traditional owners. So, um, yeah, I think that it was quite different from anything we've done before. And, and I think, um, yeah, just beneficial in a, in, in a slightly different way. Yeah. Can I add to that? Sorry, Caro. In today's world where trying to understand and 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 be part of the reconciliation of what has happened with with aboriginals i think this program provides the best way to understand because as you just said kate it's listening and listening allows us to understand doesn't matter whether it's with our ancestors or our grandparents if you think about it, you, uh, the way you learn about life is through your mum, your dad, your grandparents, your great grandparents. If you're lucky to have them alive, which I doubt any here, but uh, but that's how everybody learns, isn't it? And and is to listen and then to understand and you, you move forward. So I think it's a fantastic program, and my Bendigo clubs are going to start hearing about it via me. Oh, that's wonderful. Thank you, Glenda. Um, Caro, any more questions? Oh, or is, is... oh yes. Oh, oh yes. okay. We do have lots more questions. And I have I have some of my own here. Uh, and I have one for Zara. Zara, that was a fantastic presentation. Absolutely brilliantly done. Thank you. But we've heard a bunch of elements there. But, I mean, you're at a time of your life where you're you're, you're, you're learning and you're changing as a person. How did this immersion in the Northern Territory, in these two, in these two homelands, change you as a person? Um, that's a really interesting question and a lot of people have actually asked me that mm. question because it was kind of going into it, you know, we knew that it was going to be an experience that changed us all. We just didn't know what we were going to come out thinking or, or looking at the you know how we were going to look at the world afterwards um I think the biggest change that I found for me is that again on the topic of listening like I listen more now well you know I, I focus on listening more and I try to listen more because there's so much that we can 
learn, as I said, from listening to, you know, the elders of these communities or listening to listening to people's stories and also just listening to silences because it gives us time to think. So I think I, I, I try to speak a lot less unnecessarily and listen a lot more, I think is the biggest thing. Um, I've also kind of found a new respect for other people and you know I I didn't consider myself a judgmental person before but I kind of realized that like people who you wouldn't necessarily think oh they could you know they could change the world you know you you when you even just start up one conversation with someone you're like wow you could you could go out there and do something but I wouldn't have expected it so I I kind of have a a much I, I I would hope to say that I have a much more open mind and I listen more I think are the biggest changes. Super. Wonderful. Okay, next, hit me with the next one, Kara. Okay, the next question is for Jan. and Also an excellent presentation, Jan. I loved the way you spoke from the heart and you and you discussed things like your own circumstances on the way in and finances, that sort of thing. One of the things you touched on there uh, that you said made a difference to the project was rooks and the tax deductibility that comes from having a rooks project but what difference did it really make to your project overall the rooks and that tax deductibility make what what real difference did that make well it thanks for the question well it attracted donors you know because you know when I first started, like it, it was all unexpected and I had money in the bank to do another project which fell through. So then I started the children's home with a, a sort of a minimal budget. So then when these children were incredibly sick, so my bills for the first um, five months were more than an orphanage, a friend's orphanage that had 17 children for five years. So it was, you know, it just zapped all my funding. And um, so therefore, by having tax deductibility, it encouraged people to donate, you know, and and people are still donating. I still have donors from that very first request to help me um, that are still with me today. So that has made a big difference. And it's a really... They, they charge a minimal interest rate, 2.75, or fee, I should say. So compared to other organisations that you can auspice under, um, it's a good value for money. Mm. And and they have a really good system. So they, being uh, a member of Rorks, they actually transfer my money overseas for me. Um, so, you know, the, for the rent, the, uh, whatever, um, educational costs. So it, it offers quite a big service. And to to become to to have a project under Rourke's, I had to belong to a Rotary Club, yeah. and it's quite interesting. So then I joined Rotary to get the Rourke's project, and it's amazing how many Rourke's people joined Rotary just to be part of Rourke's. Um, I really like to find the statistics on that because it's quite large. And so, yeah, currently I'm Rourke's chair now. <laughs> I sort of didn't expect to be, but it's um, all about saying yes, I suppose, like saying yes to Susan <laughs> to speak. Oh, you, you can't say no to me. Yeah. <laughs> a, a supplementary question there, Jan, <laughs> and this, this one's a little harder perhaps to work out, but did you find that by getting onto Rourke's and by having people donate by Rourke's, that that actually created another conversation, perhaps involving those people, that gave you more publicity, if you like, for your project. No, you sort of not had a really. Rolling effect. Okay. No, no, I think no. It, they they don't promote you at all. Mm. I don't know if I got the question right, but um, you know, my fundraising came from me and my promotion mm. and my my contacts and it grew that way. Mm. So it didn't really, other than the tax deductibility, it sort of didn't really uh, bring on any more supporters, except I think it gave me credibility. You know, as in, when I first started, people were just putting money into my bank account. And then my family said, hey, you've got to stop this. <laughs> <You know, laughs> it uh, sounds a little bit criminal. Or well, you could get into a bit of trouble here. So, um, yeah, they were a lifesaver in that way. But, um, and yeah, so I think having, attaching that Rotary logo 
to my work. I think it gives me so much credibility and I'm really proud of it. And with our Women's Centre, um, between Rorks and Foundation, they actually then uh, have funded uh, a sustainable arm of my charity, and that is the Bakery Cafe through district grants and, you know, having the tax deductibility with Rorks and then the Rotary Foundation have been a great partner. Fantastic. Fantastic. I do have another question, Susan. Can I go ahead with that? Yes, go ahead. Super. Um, question, and this is perhaps a question for perhaps Kate first, but I'd be interested in what Jan might have to say about the same thing. Kate, what were the, the immersion project? It all sounds like it sounds like it went really well. I'm not, not sure whether you or Laura is the best one to answer this. What sort of barriers did you or difficulties did you run into with the project? What, what was a were there any unexpected issues in terms of participating? Well, I can't mm, think of one just at the moment. I mean, COVID was probably our biggest barrier, um, and and we were very conscious going into uh, an indigenous community mm. that we had to be very careful um, with. Um, any sort of um, inkling that a student may have had um, COVID. In fact, we had um, quite a number of students. So we were actually going to take, I think the total was 23 students with us, but we had students at the very last minute come down with COVID who unfortunately were then not able to participate at the very last minute. Uh, but even that in itself, I think that understanding of um, the importance uh, and, and the disparity between um, in the healthcare system for Indigenous people, I think that was um, it, it maybe a barrier, but it actually was a great learning experience. And I think um, just what comes to mind, and Laura might be able to add to this, uh, while we were away, um, we are in Nayu and the traditional owner there is Miriam Rose, um, Angenmir Bauman, who you you may know as the um, the senior Australian of the year last year, uh, and and she was she was I was fan girling. I'm going to be honest. She is absolutely amazing. She's as amazing in re more amazing in real life as you can imagine. Um, and you just feel like you're in the presence of somebody somebody quite wise and 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 awesome. Uh, but in the Nayu community, there'd actually been some sorry business where one of the elders had died recently, mm. and um, a lot of the of the families and the and the um, elders had left and had gone to another uh, community for what had to happen. And so when we got there, there was very few. There were very few people around, and you might think, so, you know, there were a lot of there was a lot of downtime there because the activities that we were going to participate in just didn't happen because the people weren't there, and that again, and the students really reflected on that that uh, that idea of patience and understanding where, well, this is the reason why nobody's here is because there's the very important um, considerations of sorry business and. For our students to realise the importance of that and that it did impact on our um, experience in some ways, but actually the real impact was the understanding. And, I I mean, you just couldn't make that happen. It was just, you know, it was just brilliant. Um, I, I don't know, Laura, if there was anything else that um, in the organisation side? Yeah, I think certainly um, COVID was a big one and it, the, the particular restrictions or the... Um, the risk management that we had was more was stricter than like government rules or, or um, state rules um, for that reason that we were going into communities that were particularly vulnerable and so being a close contact mean, meant that some students couldn't travel whereas you know technically legally they could cross state borders but that was something that the organization had said you know, we want to be particularly careful um, so that was a, a little bit tricky but as Kate said an, an important opportunity for us to share as a group of to say you know that that might mean that we restrict some people but we want to be so careful and that's part of the way that we show respect is by um having that that extra level of um of safety and of of being careful and respectful um 
Yeah, in terms of uh, just on an organizational level, I suppose that there's always conversations around risk and how to manage risk and where there are parents' money involved and, and all of those things. Um, but at the end of the day, the school was very supportive and, and could rec recognize, you know, the, the wonderful opportunity that this would be to our girls, not only as um, as students and individuals themselves, but, you know, Zara is now part of a cohort that they are now the the oldest students in the school, they are the leaders of the school and to have 16 young women who have gone through this experience who are now in leadership um, positions in our school, we can imagine the, the enormous blessing that that is to us um, as a school as well. Fantastic, thanks Laura. Susan, we're nearly, we're coming up, just coming up on the air now. So did you want to summarize what's been a great yeah. presentation? Thank you, Carol, I would like to summarise. I'd like to um, really thank the Ravenswood team for coming on board. Um, I hope that the Rotarians present think that it was, uh, as I think, it is the most valuable presentation and it really showed us that, that you can empower young women in all sorts of ways, not just by providing them with basic health and education and menstrual health products, but we can empower them through the quality of their education and the programs that you provide them with. I hes hesitate to say that um, maybe if Glenda is looking at providing information to schools in Bendigo that maybe the Bendigo clubs might help fund some of this program, I'm sure. <laughs> but um, I would like to say to Zara that I have um, heard lots of young women speak over many, many years and you blew me away. You're absolutely awesome. And your toolkit I think we could all take a great deal out of that toolkit. You're almost making me want to cry. I'm just so impressed. And um, so what I'd like to say is, while I am disappointed that two of our pres presenters weren't able to be part of tonight, I, I think it achieved what I wanted it to achieve. And hopefully those people who watch this recording later on will have the same feeling. So I thank you all very much for giving up an hour of your valuable time. And Elaine, I really thank you because it's really much later in New Zealand than it is here. So um, I look forward to meeting you in Canberra, Elaine, and Merwin, I look forward to meeting you in Canberra. Amanda, are you going to Canberra? Great. So, um, Thank you all very much. And a big thank you to Kero because this wouldn't have happened without him. I am a literate idiot as far as computer stuff is goes. And um, without his help and assistance, we wouldn't have had it. So thank you very, very much. Thank, thank you, Susan. Now, hang on. Now, this is, we have a little tradition here. Everybody turn your microphones on, please. This is where we do the thunderous applause theme for these this for this uh, uh, group of wonderful people who've given us a great presentation tonight. Okay, let's big round of applause, folks. Great work, great work, everyone. That was absolutely fantastic. Well done. Thank you. Thanks, Caro. I really, really appreciate what you did. Thank you. Good, Good night. Good night, everyone. Good night. Thank, Good night. You. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, Susan. Thank